Well, I think it's about that time to get started. Welcome to our third annual climate talk hosted by the Geography Graduate Student Association. My name is Corey Monteverdi. I'm a PhD student here. Um, I'm also the president of GGSA. Um, but before we get started with intros and our couple hour long discussion, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Edward, who is going to lead us in a prayer. So Edward, I'm going to invite you up to lead us in an opening prayer. All right, thank you, Edward. For those of you coming in, go ahead and find a, a seat. Um, we're gonna have an intimate time today. Um, but Giorgio, did you want to follow that up with the land acknowledgement that you prepared? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So before we uh, continue on, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. So uh, starting on the very right, we have Tino Villaluz, who is with the Swinomish tribe. Thank you, Tina, for being here. We have Mike Connolly Misquish, which is the Kumeyaay Nation. We have Edward Wimatiwa, who just led us in prayer from the Zuni tribe. We have Dr. Ora Mer Martinez with the Navajo Nation. And we also have Duranda Hinky from the Fort McDermott tribe. And those are going to be our speakers today. And so we're focused solely on indigenous speakers uh, led by two moderators. So we have Shasta Gon, who is the um, environmental director and the tribal historic preservation officer for the Paula Band of Mission Indians. And we also have Giorgio Hattie Curti, who is a geographer and ethnographer who works towards the development and implementation of land and water, water stewardship. So with that, I'm gonna give it to Giorgio, who's going to follow up Edward's prayer with a land acknowledgement that he prepared uh, in coordination uh, with some of our speakers as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Giorgio. Um, and then they are going, Giorgio and Shasta are going to be leading us in a discussion uh, followed up by a QA session at the end. So, Giorgio, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Corey. Since time immemorial, the Kumeyaay people, Ipai to the north, Tipai to the south, Kamiya to the inland, and all of those who have used and continue to use the self-identifier Degeno, whether by active choice or colonial imposition, have been a part of the lands and waters we often call today San Diego County. These lands and waters have nourished, healed, protected, and been intimate and indelible parts of the familial and social of Kumeyaay for many, many generations, and continue to be today. With, in, of, and through these lands and waters, Kumeyaay have practiced familial and social relationships of stewardship, care, balance, and harmony. Relational practices that live and support life always for the people. What I have been taught by the Kumeyaay people with and for whom I work is that the depth and weight of what it means for an act, a thought, a song, a prayer, a method, an offering, an action, a practice to be for the people can only truly be glimpsed and loosely grasped when notions of the person and concepts of the social are opened up to relations and capacities that exist far before and far beyond dominant and dominating human-centric errors and blinders. As members of the San Diego State University community and residents of the city and county of San Diego, it is imperative that those of us who are not indigenous to these lands and waters recognize that we are contributing to a settler colonial institution that we are ourselves settlers in indigenous Kumeyaay lands, and that more often than not, we are directly implicated in promulgating, promoting and perpetuating these dominant and dominating errors and blinders, whether passively or actively. We must both acknowledge this legacy and ongoing presence of coloniality and take ownership of the fact that each one of us has a deep obligation and weighted responsibility to actively and productively work towards restorative geographical, historical, political, cognitive, legal, educational, and social justice with and for Kumeyaay people, wherever, whenever, and however they deem appropriate. It is thus essential that the language of land acknowledgments, land acknowledgments not be confused for the production of spaces for equitable and corrective action, or those of representational recognition mistaken for productive systemic change. If acknowledgments are to be meaningful, they must be continually generative. Therefore, so too must they be accompanied by actionable institutional respect and operational structural inclusion 
in perspective, policy, practice, return, and restoration of the knowledge and political sovereignty of Kumeyaay people, and indeed all Native peoples, to all ancestral and familial lands and waters. On January 20th, 2021, President Biden issued Executive Order 13985 on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. The Pueblo of Zuni responded with a government-to-government -government consultation letter to the Biden-Harris administration and Office of Management and Budget, in part stating, all lands and waters within and intersecting the borders and boundaries of the United States are native lands and waters. This basic fact must first be formally addressed, officially recognized, operationally accounted for, and serve as the basis of any honest and sincere effort at advancing equity and support for the underserved Ashiwi community and Pueblo of Zuni, and indeed all Native American tribes and communities. Recalling your own recent words this past June, Mr. President, quote, great nations don't ignore their most painful moments. They don't ignore those moments of the past. They embrace them. Great nations don't walk away. We come to terms with the mistakes we made, unquote. These mistakes of settler colonial nations are as deep as they are enduring and as prevalent as they are dispossessing and alienating globally and locally yesterday and today. As Potawatomi climate and environmental justice scholar Kyle White has explained, colonial and industrial induced climate change is in fact just one intensive manifestation of environmental change born of settler colonial societies, quote, Thinking about climate justice against indigenous peoples is less about envisioning a new future and more like the experience of deja vu. This is because climate injustice is part of a cyclical history situated within the larger struggle of anthropogenic environmental change catalyzed by colonialism, industrialism, and capitalism, not three unfortunately converging courses of history." Unquote. Flowing through the heart and enveloping the mind of colonial, industrial, and capitalistic actors and their judgments, values, perspectives, choices, politics, and practices driving climate change are what English anthropologist Gregory Bateson identified 50 years ago as epistemological fallacies and errors of dominant and dominating Western systems of logic and value. Quoting Bateson, the last hundred years have demonstrated empirically that if an organism or aggregate of organisms sets to work with a focus on its own survival, and thinks that that is the way to select its adaptive moves, its quote unquote progress ends up with a destroyed environment. If the organism ends up destroying its environment, it has in fact destroyed itself. And such epistemological error is all right, it's fine, up to the point at which you create around yourself a universe in which that error becomes imminent in monstrous changes of the universe that you have created and now try to live in. These epistemological fallacies and errors inform and guide not only how we frame the possible futures that climate change may or may not bring, but limit what, we may, what may be included of various pasts. Matthews and Barnes address this in their introduction to an important 2016 special issue of the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute. They note, just as states have sought to manipulate the past by celebrating some moments in history and silencing others, so too they have linked these selected pasts to particular futures. The question of the past then, if looked at in the right way, has always also been a question about the future. The future can be told as a story, calculated as a probability, or speculated upon as a form of potentially valuable risk. The future is not one, but many. And those who create futures typically seek to narrow down what the future can be to a relatively limited subset of possible registers. I have been taught by the Kumiai and Ashiwi, Atahum and Dene. Co Salish and Chalat, Lakota and Dakota, Paiute and Shoshone, that to truly acknowledge indigenous lands and waters is also always to recognize, honor, and respect both the futures and past of non human and more than human relations that have existed from the times of the beginning of the beginning or the beginning with no beginning. These are relationships of the air and winds, the mists and clouds, the soils and minerals, the animals and the plants, the stars and the constellations, what is below and what is above. This is the life of land, air, and water. This is the capacitational life that colonial and industrial-induced climate change monstrously effaces and eviscerates. Anishinaabe experience and wisdom have identified how invasive ideologies of settler colonial societies often manifest in and as invasive land ethics. We can term these mutual manifestations invasive species of thought in order to better amplify recognition and more fully name the implications of how they function in and as 
ongoing processes of thought and action that exceedingly work in the interest of sustaining privilege for some and perpetuating the destruction, dispossession, marginalization, and alienation of many, many others. An etymological excavation of the term species reveals its root to be the Latin specere, an inflection of specio, meaning to observe, watch, or look at. As this suggests, considerations of what species are exist as culturally imbued constructions cataloging, categorizing, and classifying complex formational differences of the life of the world. Wherein one such categorizational schemes become invasive is in their deployments that confuse abstractions and fictions of understanding for a singular reality beholden to narrow and limited Western notions of valid knowledge production, linear time, geometrized space, and their attendant economic, developmental, and capitalist values that reify and rationalize devastation of places, land and waterscapes, social relationships of reciprocity, and capacities for health and well-being for a multitude of peoples, human, non-human, and more than human alike. These are the invasive species of thought and action that brought to all of us and brought all of us to the increasing effects of industrial and colonial-induced climate change. Kyle White and South Asian environmentalist Claude Alvarez have each respectfully identified how, as an environmental injustice, settler colonialism is a social process by, it, by which at least one society seeks to establish its own collective continuance at the expense of the collective continuance of one or more other societies. And Western science, as an associative colonial power, functions not any less brazenly and effectively, extending its hegemony by intimidation, propaganda, catechism, and political force. With today's climate talks, we seek to perform a double movement of turning and returning the gaze on these invasive species and their processes of thought, action, and inaction while offering productive pathways to enter into restorative and just correctives of and for relational life and relational lifeway systems. Boonpol scholar Eileen Morton Robinson has identified how indigenous pasts and futures and the relational lifeways intimately and indelibly enfolding and enfolded by them are constrained and imposed upon settler colonial gazes of social and governmental white possessive logics. She explains how these racialized logics manifest and function as under and invisible assets that benefit white people in their everyday lives. They are possessions. These assets include simple things such as not having to educate white children about systemic racism for their protection and having white identity affirmed in society on a daily basis through positive representations in the media, government policies, legislation, and the education system. Assets such as these are derived from and contribute to the normalization of white possessiveness, which remains invisible to white people in everyday practice. Within, through, and beyond mainstream Western climate policy and governance, White possessive logics and their unearned privileges are invasively operationalized within discourses to circulate sets of meanings about ownership of the nation as part of common sense knowledge, decision making, and socially produced conventions, and underpinned by an excessive desire to invest in reproducing and reaffirming the nation state's ownership, control, and domination. Through misplaced confidence and highly partial knowledge schemes built through methodologies that pretend they have no foundational philosophies and their white possessive couplings to an ideology of manifest destiny that continues to be fueled by a sense of entitled racial and religious superiority maintained through networks and relations of power and privilege, various manifestations of settler colonial domination endure through mainstream climate science policy and practice as an associate to colonial power to allied considerations and undermine capacities of and for resilience and collective continuance of indigenous peoples. The epistemological and ontological groundings of these white possessive logics is one that continually separates and isolates and mistakes labeling and identification for knowledge and superimposes on nature a mathematical and geometrical grid like the land survey system. These units, in turn, are used as the basis for dealing with the land, but they are not part of the nature of the land. While the invasive, racialized logics and species of thought underpinning these enduring injustices are omnipresent in settler colonial societies, their operations are often concomitantly unidentified and unnamed in both their settler colonial governmental and academic possessive deployments. When promulgating, promoting, and perpetuating epistemological errors driving climate change and the invasive species of thought attempting to address sustainability through unsustainable epistemologies and valuations, our institutions become perverse. And when enabling institutional and structural monstrosities, whether passively or actively, we ourselves become monstrous. This is perhaps why in 2020, McGregor et al. took the position that 
Indigenous environmental justice is required in order to address both the challenges of the ecological crisis, as well as various forms of violence and injustices experienced specifically by Indigenous peoples. This must be grounded in Indigenous philosophies, ontologies, and epistemologies in order to reflect Indigenous conceptions of what constitutes justice. The lesson then, if we're to become worthy to the challenge, challenges of today's climate talks, is to begin to come to know from the deep time and deep space knowledges, sciences, and wisdoms that form and, true to get and grew together with the lands and waters of what we often call today the United States of America, how to start to find just pathways to build and rebuild circuits for correctives to the epistemological errors and invasive species of thought to continue to drive our dominant modes of knowledge production, evaluation, and valuation of pasts and futures, scientific, philosophical, economic, or otherwise, to become less monstrous in thought and action. You, the audience, are the future climate scientists and the present and future decision makers. There are many more possibilities for inclusive, productive, balanced, collective, restorative, and generative past and futures out there for the people than what your algorithms, models, and projections commonly tell. Thanks, Giorgio. And we're now going to take the opportunity for our panelists to spend some time telling us about themselves. And we want to start with Mike Connolly. Mike? Halka uh, Menuea, Wichihi Michael Connolly, Misquish. Uh, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Connolly, Misquish. I'm from the Campo Reservation. And uh, I, you know, wow, you know, George, you know, I was, I was, I was trying to follow, you know, was I, was I going to talk about that? Was I going to talk about that? You know, you're, you're just hitting, uh, hitting so many things, but um, I, I have a background in uh, engineering. Uh, I was an aerospace engineer for about 10 years before I, I saw the light and uh, left the field and went in over into the environmental sciences and started working, um, working for my tribe and at the, uh, Environmental Protection Agency that we had established. I've been a councilman for 17 years. Uh, I went on to get a, a master's degree in economics, and and I'm currently uh, working on a sociocultural anthropology degree at UCSD. Um, th over 30 years ago, the um, when I first started working with the uh, with the Campo EPA, I started getting involved in. And um, in researching our traditional land use practices and and finding ways that we could we could take our traditional knowledge and apply it to the present situation and and one of the things that we we found was the the use of rock drop structures to um, um, to help slow down the flow of water to enhance recharge and to to raise the water table and create wetlands and and um, and this was something that we decided would be the it would be the the keystone or the start of our uh, uh, of our efforts within the reservation, and it was very successful, and we we had a very dramatic impact to our wetland area. and And as as I did more research, I saw that you know not only was this technique something that we used, it was common all the way down the Baja Peninsula and all throughout the Southwest, and and in fact, uh, uh, out in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, I think they refer to them as Zuni dams. So uh, they. These uh, structures have been a, a big part of of um, uh, of the practices that, that native people have been doing in dry climates, and they and they kind of duplicate the process that that beaver do in places where you have perennial stream flow. Um, so humans jumped in and and uh, and took on that role in in the drier climates. So so that was the start, and then you know as I made contacts with more people within my own community and people in other communities, we just we just started uh, going from there where there was a, a real resurgence in, of interest in our in our own culture and how to make it stronger. There, there were there were some resources for some of the tribes because of gaming that, that afforded more of an opportunity for them to to actually pursue a lot of the cultural knowledge that that had, you know, I won't say it was lost, I'd say it was dormant. And uh, and so we wanted to bring that back and and have it implemented and and uh, some very dedicated people who who brought in so much of the knowledge of, of the different plants and our relationship to the plants and um, we were able to to go in and and uh, research and write our history from our perspective 
and um, and go in and, and look at, at our at our culture and the and the variety within our culture. It's not a we're not a monoculture. We have a, a great deal of variety from uh, from reservation to re reservation and even within some of the reservations. So this um, eventually led to the creation of Kumeyaay Community College, and we now act, have a degree, an associate degree that we offer in Kumeyaay studies. And we're working on a bachelor's degree with San Diego State um, in that same major. So this has really been uh, been a great trip for us. And where this ties into this conference and why it's it's um, it's really um, uh, why I agreed to come here, why I thought it was important to come in and speak on these issues is is as in the beginning we were. The, you know, our focus was solely within our community. I wasn't doing this work to uh, to get any kind of award from anyone or recognition from any organization other than within our own community and our own people, and and that was really the um, really the focus. And and after the after the year two thousand and and um, as the twenty first century started, we we got more and more interest from people who wanted to to know about the things that we were doing, how we, how we tended the, the plants in our ecosystem and uh, how we did the rock drop structures and how we managed fire to create a fire mosaic that was this, um, this environment of, of many, many transitional ecotones with, with a, a much higher carrying capacity for the land. That also eliminated the catastrophic fires that, that, uh, that you see nowadays. And, so as this interest came, of course, we were we were eager to share because we had and we have that relationship with this land here. We have that it's it's more, uh, you know, the the idea of sovereignty is is that we, we use that a lot because it's the legal term that we have to use to in dealing with the United States because they don't understand anything else in the law. But our relationship was far more intimate and far more intense between ourselves and the land. It wasn't that of a sovereign with domination that ruled over the land. It was a partnership and a, uh, and a relationship with the plants and, and the animals. And, and it included reciprocity to where, you know, we were taking from the environment, but we were also giving back and we had responsibilities to it. And and this this way of thinking was was intimately connected into all of the things we did, whether it was the the, the use of fire or or, um, or creating wetlands or, or any of these other things. So as people came and started asking us, you know, hey, can you share some more of that with us? And and we were doing it through Kumia Community College and we were doing it through presentations and meetings with regulators. And, and, and as the climate people started coming in, they started wanting to know more about it. And we're, we're happy to, to share that and I'm happy to share it. And I share it from the same basis that I have before that I, I'm trying to improve this land that I hold so sacred and so dear that's that's important to me. And I, I wanna make sure that it's taken care of even if it's not by me, you know, even if other people, I have to train other people to do it. I, I still wanna see that happen. But I wonder sometimes when I see, when I hear about the motivations and you know, what what are we doing uh, what what is the how does this fit into the overall picture of what we're doing? And, and when I hear when I hear that we're um, we're in an existential crisis that we we, uh, we which which means existence itself is being jeopardized. But I wonder what existence are they talking about? What is it that we're doing? What what is it that they want to help them preserve? Is it the status quo? Is it the business as usual? Are our techniques being used to help perpetuate a system that maybe we don't agree with? Maybe this um, this capitalist colonial system has flaws that need to be corrected. Maybe those corrections are things that we should be pushing for. It's not just taking what we do and repeating it, but also revising the approach that's being used, changing that perception of what the world is. Resources. Resources are what? They, they're defined things to exploit, things to convert into cash. Is that what they should be seeing? If we're sharing our knowledge, we need to change that perception as well 
so that that it's not being seen that way we our word for body is mutt our word for the land is mutt when we talk about the land we're talking about our own body we have no word for nature the idea of nature is nature is everything except human beings how can you exist like that how can you even have that kind of perception of the world you have to see yourself in terms of being a part of that world around you and and so these are, are concepts that I, I don't know that, uh, er, that all the time when I'm talking to people and they're talking about climate and they're talking about ex existential threat, are they really seeing this kind of, of, um, of different perception? When they talk about the green economy, what, what does that mean? Is that a perpetuation of what exists? Are they saying, you know, when they talk about uh, green market trading, carbon credits, things like that. Isn't that using the same capitalist system that has created the issues that are here before? So say we resolve it. Say we resolve the, the carbon issue. The same system that created that problem and many other problems is still perpetuating itself. It's still going. We'll just have another existential crisis that's going to, to come along because of that. So isn't it time to, to then step back and take a different perspective on it? There's no, I don't want you all to go and become Kumeyaay philosophers. I, the, the, uh, there are many different indigenous ways of viewing the world, but just to understand the fact that there are other ways of viewing the world. There are these other ontologies, as, as was said earlier, that uh, these other perspectives on how we relate to the world and how can we then um, in start incorporating those into, into our practices and into our laws. And, and just because something, you know, we call it existential that, you know, do we, we don't want that to just become a, a, uh, a word that erases everything else that we no longer, uh, or that we're, uh, expected to ignore everything else that exists in in favor of doing whatever the bidding is of whoever is making that claim, or if it's got green labeled on it, is it just green washing? Is it really green? Is what is what does green even mean? Uh, if people go in and take some indigenous people and put them on their board of directors. Uh, and they continue the same pra extractive practices that they were doing before. Are they then, are they green? Are they social? Does that mean they, they believe in social justice? Um, so there's a lot of questions that, that I, I'm posing these as questions, but, you, you know, I, I, I do have my own perception of what I think is the, is the direction that I would go as, as a Kumeyaay person, but I can't speak for other people. And, and I don't know, I always question myself. It, Maybe there's some other way also that's even better or that, um, that there's other perceptions that can be brought to bear in there. And, and so I've, I'm always uh, open and wanting to, to have that dialogue, to have that critique and discussion and, and to question my own foundational arguments that, that are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I think as as moderators, we're supposed to be sort of, you know, just sitting here neutrally observing and I'm just wanting to like get down on my knees and be like, yes. <laughs> so thank you for that. And um, now we're going to hear from Tino. Yeah, thank you. Um, great words. Kind of in the same boat as Shasta. I just uh, appreciate all that that I will learn in this setting. Um, no, the first thing that comes to mind is I look out over this crowd and I think about who's on Zoom and I think about Giorgio's introduction. And I don't know if that's going to be available in broadcast, but if that introduction made you even a little bit uncomfortable, if you if you felt some of that words, those words, and if you looked at life just a little bit differently, thank you. Like, thank you, because you're probably light years ahead of the current leaders and the current politicians and 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 people within the fields of climate scientists uh there is marginalization and, and uh denial 
is probably the most prevalent thing that we deal with on a daily basis. And it doesn't matter if we're in Northwest Washington, where I'm from, or, or here in Kumeyaay country, or you know, down further on the Baja or, or in Central America, people with this nature-based worship, these indigenous people all have a, a solid subset of nature and what it is and that you are a part of nature, not apart from nature. And I think that is so key as we move forward because as an indigenous person and as a, the, a member of a community that's uh, like Michael said, that is in terms, in legal terms, a federally recognized tribe. Um, our existence depends on nature and how we steward nature into the future, how we adapt, adaptation will lead to preservation. And I think the future in terms of, you know, looking beyond a capitalistic subset uh, is, lies within these tribal communities, just because I think and you can insert inherent bias here, but we have a stronger foundation in our beliefs and, and what we are. I mean, in my world, if it's been taught to me some, from a very young age, the air, the water, the animals, the plants, they are not uh, separate from me, but they are me, similar to what, what you heard here. Um, they cease to exist, I cease to exist. The systemic genocide that, that I you know, was talking to earlier about, it's a war that we're fighting every day. And a lot of times with an unusual opponent or adversary, right? There are people that are, uh, and I'm a callous person, so I'm and rough around the edges, but uh, who are apologists. And that's not what we're ever looking for. These people actually perpetuate the same atrocities as before. So um, as you guys advance into the world and you become the, the next generation of leaders and climate scientists and politicians, and you know, I don't know that we're not looking at the next, you know, president or anything else. Like, all those sounds cliche-ish, but they're but they're here. And if you can take a part of the today and, and carry it with you, I think the world will be better for it. So I don't know. I think this is more introduction. I think we'll get to some specific questions later where I think I can elaborate on a lot of things, especially the things that affect my life. I, uh, I like the touching on the carbon credits because the carbon credits are, are a wonderful scam, right? What, what, who the hell is our, our, our uh, client, if we're selling carbon credits, right? We're perpetuating this horrible existence of atrocities uh, on nature and then selling it back to ourselves and saying that we're doing something wonderful. Um, pretty frustrating navigating that world in a professional sense and trying to deal with a lot of the things. I mean, uh, you heard it earlier. Sovereignty, sovereignty is a legal term, but then I, in the same legal sense, I have to claim dependence. So how can I be a dependent sovereign? Oxymorons, like uh, the, these are the wars we fight. And then, and like I said, the, the thing that resonates with me is just the keys to our existence. And, and it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. If we don't stand up and fight, nobody's going to, and we will eventually, the, the systemic genocide will continue and, and be successful. And I think um, economic development was touched on earlier is one of the keys that those things are, are causing a resurgence of native peoples. And I think, you know, as long as we are responsible with it and we hold responsible to nature, um, I'm a treaty tribe, come from a treaty tribe, the, that treaty, is literally my inheritance. It's not a physical, uh, tangible thing that, that was reserved by my ancestors. It is an identity. And the, the identity is that connection to all the natural world, um, all of the things that we hold holy. And with that comes a big legal hammer that we will we walk in every day with and try to perpetuate that existence. So I'll stop there. Um, we got next, but I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you, Tino. Uh, and we're going to move on to Edward. Good afternoon. I guess I, I'd like to start by talking about our, our philosophy as Ashwi. We're, we're known as Zuni, but we don't have a Z in our, in our alphabet, so go figure. <laughs> so as Ashwi, we're, we are agrarian, based on agrarian community uh, philosophy. And so as Ashwi, we occupy a semi-desert, uh, semi-arid landscape in northwestern New Mexico. Our land base includes Arizona, but in 1912, when the Arizona was being recognized, New Mexico was being recognized, Arizona did recognize us. And so the Zuni reservation was uh, located or defined in New Mexico. However, our most sacred ancestral site is in Arizona. And um, so we fought to acquire lands in Arizona just to make sure that we had a buffer zone in one of our sacred areas. And in fact, if you wanna know more about this sacred site, you can go to this book called Zuning the Courts. And it talks about the period uh, from mid 1970s uh, when the Zunis were one, when we were on one of our foot pilgrimages from our Zuni village in New Mexico to Arizona to the confluence of the Zuni River and the Little Colorado River. At that confluence is, is where Whispering Springs uh, is located. Whispering Springs uh, is a sacred springs. And the reason why it's called Whispering Springs in Zuni, it would be called Hatingaya. The reason why it's called Whispering Springs is that within that particular reach of the Little Colorado River, in ancient time, we lost children to a flood. And uh, so every four years, we make a two-day foot pilgrimage and two-day foot pilgrimage back to the village. And it happens during the summer solstice when we do our summer rain dances. And so, in um, the mid 1970s, on one of these pilgrimages, the Zunis were, were, were blocked. It was a peaceful religious pilgrimage and the Zuni pilgrimage was blocked by ranchers in, within the area. And um, we stood our ground, we had surrounding communities support us and before it went to court, we settled. And um, so, so really, um, what, what this talks about is just the hostility towards our people, the Ashwi just trying to hold on to certain ancestral sites. The, the ranchers actually in their trucks carrying rifles, they actually knocked down a couple of equestrians. And so that's how ugly got. As a tribal councilman in the subsequent years, uh, to that event, um, I had spent a lot of time in the courts, dealing with water rights in the Arizona sites. Right now we're dealing with water rights on the New Mexico side. Interestingly, the headwaters in the Arizona side where, where our sacred site is, right, the confluence of the Zuni River and the Little Colorado River upstream where a watershed is, it was the same people that blocked us on our watershed in New Mexico. So, so what does this mean in, in hindsight? I guess just to illustrate um, what an agrarian philosophical land base is, as a Pueblo, we call ourselves Pueblo. Our villages are central. Our villages, if, if you went and looked at our village today, it was cluster of seven pueblos. In fact, we were the seven cities of gold when Coronado came looking for the seven cities of gold. Our first contact was in 1540, July. Coronado and his conquistadors, they took over one of our village called Hawiku. So that was 
our first contact, our village of first contact, how we cook. It means grass wrapped around. That's where we lost Tuni Zuni warriors. The conquistadors took over Hawiku. They found the salt deposits, the, the seed rooms, and um, they found chickens. But they were actually describing turkeys because we were turkey farmers. We kept turkey flocks. And so when, when, when you look at this history, when you look at the Pueblos, we were central. Our villages are still central because a greater outside, the mesas, the outer regions, they were protected for wildlife, for elk, deer, bear, and um, all these, these animals mean something to us. I did an opening prayer and I asked for guidance from the water beings, the, from the um, ancestor spirit. I also acknowledge four directions, mountain lion, the bear, the badger, and so on. And so in our Pueblo system, we're central, but we make sure that the outer perimeter, perimeter is, is left alone for, for these animals to live. And so when we do go out, we make sure we acknowledge the canyons, the mountains, the rivers, and that we ask for permission when we take something. So when we look at our life as a Pueblo, as Ashwi, and when we look at where we come from, we come from the Grand Canyon. We traverse the landscape, the whole Southwest region of the United States and, and, and our migration extended into Mexico. And if you look at these critical village site or sacred sites, when I talk about sacred sites, we're talking about how we could first place of first contact. One of our major sites is Chaco Canyon. When we talk about a major Sacred site and homeland, it's in Pakime, nor northern, northern New Mexico. So if you look at these communities, there's a lot of similar similarities in architecture. The openings, the upper half of the opening, the upper half of the opening, they're wide, the lower half narrow. They support ladders. But what you can't see. Um, is in the subsurface. The findings that are recorded when, when the lands are excavated, yes, they tell us something. Because today, if you come to my village, we still practice what is recorded in the subsurface in, in Pakime, for example, in New Casas Grandes. If you come to our village, we have a place called the place of uh, skulls. It's in our sacred corn mesa. It's a huge mesa, beautiful mesa. There, there's a little cavern where bear skulls are housed. Mountain lion skulls are housed. In fact, when my little brother was governor 20 years ago in, in 2000, he informed the, the county sheriffs, the state police that if ever, on I-40, which is about maybe have an hour drive from us. If there's ever a bear that gets run over a mountain lion, get that mountain lion that gets hit on I-40, bring the animal to us. We'll intern the animal. And so that's where in those during those periods, and even now, when we intern the bear, for example, the skull goes to the special resting place. So we're still practicing what is seen in the south, in the subsurface. So we're, we're an ancient culture. We, there, there's, um, the work that I'm dealing with is a language and I don't wanna to talk too much about it until the work is published, but the language says a lot. And um, 
where we find ourselves today is that as, as um, peoples that emerge from the Grand Canyons, the four underworlds, if you go to Grand Canyon, you go down to the Colorado River, there's a lot of activity along the Colorado River. There's fishing, there's boating, but you will hardly see any people of color down along the Colorado River. You will not see any Zunis fishing or enjoying the river, but that is our homeland. So imagine a landscape of our migra migration route. Interestingly, when we first emerged from the four underworlds onto the landscape, the first concern of the Zuni people, the Ashwi, was that there's a story that talks about an individual that joined the peoples. The people were afraid of this individual for good reason. He's the one that demonstrated that he had a power over life, that he had the power to protect us, to take a life. And he said, I have to be among the people because I'm going to be controlling life and death. So what does it mean? If we look at it, what happened then in ancient time, and we look at it now, it makes sense. This person was going to be controlling life and death because we had to make sure that we lived within our means, that there can't be overpopulation. That's, 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 that's an ancient prophecy, that we have to control life and death, that we have to live within our means. And so as a Zuni people, we, we, we know that there's that agreement with, with the ancestor spirit. But now when you look at it, it's like our landscape and as a people, there's a layer of, of chicken wire draped over us. The chicken wire that could be what we called um, an instrument that was devised by the railroad system, the checkerboard area. What does that mean? It means that throughout our history as indigenous peoples, we were denied our right to traverse the ancestral land as we did. In one case, in, in early 2000, when we were trying to protect the sacred site, Salt Mother, or the Zuni Salt Lake area. The Zuni Salt Lake is an interesting geological feature. It's a crater, volcanic crater within the crater, and with it, within it lives Salt Mother. And I'll talk about that later. But anyway, we were challenged. So if the, the Zuni Salt Lake site is so important, how come you as Zuni, you stopped the pilgrimages? Obviously, we crossed the Jacob Ward area. We were trespassing. Laws haven't been Indian friendly. We find ourselves in court. I just mentioned earlier when our pilgrims, went to the confluence of the Zuni River and the, the, the Zuni River and the Little Colorado River. What happened? Our pilgrims were blocked. So, so the privatiza privatization of lands and the Chikoport area just made it worse. Now there's another layer. Let's look at the political layer. As a small tribe, there's only 10,000 people on the reservation. There's only 13,000 Zunis in the world. So when we look at this, this next layer of politics as indigenous peoples, not just as Zunis, but as indigenous peoples, we are a small voice. They say, if you don't have a voice in Washington, DC, you don't matter. In Washington, DC, only large voices make a difference. And, and, and we can go deeper in that system. But there was one, um, one uh, former CIA who, ta who talked on one of the morning shows and said the voting system never worked for indigenous peoples here in the US. And, <clears throat> and there was a black attorney that worked in 
DC, a different show, a different subject, he said a similar thing that this will never work for indigenous peoples. And going back to the CIA, former CIA member who talked about indigenous peoples here in the US that didn't have a voice or the system didn't work for them. He said that with the Sunni, not the Zuni here, but with the Sunni on the other side, and this was around 2012, he mentioned that the Sunnis during the war, he said the Sunnis and these Shiites, they're little tribal peoples. The same system did not work for those peoples. And in order to be heard, the Sunnis, they had to pick up arms to fight. That has been the landscape for indigenous peoples internationally. When we go back to the 80s and we go to El Salvador, or when we go to Guatemala, same scenario. All these Guatemalans want to do the El Salvadorians, El Salvadorians, El Salvadorians want to do was just protect their homeland, their ag fields. And no, they were forced to pick up arms. These were people that only owned hoes and shovels. My friend, I don't know if I should mention his name, but Nim in Guatemala, he was 12 years old when he was given a rifle. By 16, he was, was overseeing, he was a commander. And, and those people in Guatemala in the 80s and in, in El Salvador, he, these children grew up fast. Many indigenous people, we grew up fast in, in these situations. And so, when, when we look at where we come from in, in my lifetime, and um, I look at the landscape within the recent years. For example, when I look back to 2007, when the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted, was September 13, 2007 at United Nations. When they adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it was supposed to be, be an international law that protected us and that it would be a new platform where our countries, like for example, here in the US, if we cannot get justice, that there'll be a forum where we can go to and we will get our human rights recognized, it will be justice. So just on that statement, I look at the Dan sisters. There was Mary and Carrie Dan, Western Shoshone people in Nevada. If you look at their case, if, if, if you Google American outrage, is a docu documentary about their life, you will see the struggle that they dealt with. They were, they were living a nightmare because the U.S. BLM land, Bureau of Land Management, they were rounding up their cows, their horses, and they wanted the Dan sisters out of their, that territory. The Dan sisters were supposedly trespassing on U.S. soil. Well, as it turned out, the Dan sisters, they had the Treaty of Ruby Valley. This was the same treaty that was given to them by the US. US failed to do their homework. So in those 30 years of fight, when the doors closed on the Dan sisters, they went to the United Nations and they won their case because they had the treaty, Ruby Valley, US had none. So looking at that time and, and looking at it from that period, not quite 20 years yet, the, the UN Declaration of Rights of has been implemented, tested, and it doesn't have any teeth. Abel Morales, first indigenous president of Bolivia, 2006 to 2019, he, he made the UN drip, the law of the land in Bolivia, 
But in 2019, in a coup d'etat, he was removed as government. Somebody by the name of Janine Agnès had, had picked him up. His life was in danger. He fled. Well, the US and the European nations, they said, this Janine Agnès was a political prisoner. That statement can only come when it's going to be embarrassing. Nobody stood up for him else when his presidency was being termed, when his personal life was being termed. So as an indigenous people person, what does this mean? Well, we have the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous People Law, but it's not going to make a big difference until everybody says that we're going to start honoring these not this past Friday, but a week prior on April 7th, a gentleman by the name of Benjamin. Benjamin, when, 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 <coughs> Benjamin Ferenc. On April 7th, Benjamin Ferenc, he passed away. He's, he was um, an attorney in the US and he, took 22 Nazis to court for, for, for human crimes, crimes on humanity. And he won. Of the 22 people that he took to court, 14 were hung for, for violating the human rights. What does this mean? Well, His dream was to establish an international court. There is an international court. The only thing is that it doesn't work because countries like US, they're not participants to this international court. So if there's an international court, there's the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it's not gonna make any difference until these countries like Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, those four countries, they house the largest populations of indigenous people. They're the most, they're the countries that do the most extractive industries. And so if we want to curb climate change, we have to look at these countries that agree to do the right thing, but yet when it comes to making change, they look the other way. Thank you for your attention. I didn't mean to be long-winded, but I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Edward and uh, Aura. Oh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yat esh e Aura Merrick Martinez yinishe. Tzilt ane nishle do ni me pui pata se bashish chin. Ado kis ani e dasha che do belagana e dash nele. A good ego e sani nishle. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Aura. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation, but more specifically, I come from a very long line of women who are, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Mountain Cove clan. My father was Nespers from Northern Idaho. Uh, my maternal grandfather was Hopi, Sun Clan from Oraivi. And my paternal grandfather was actually Bohemian and Italian, which is where Merrick comes from. Um, I am a, a Nispers and Navajo woman. My pronouns are she, asa, ayat. Um, and I originally come from uh, Lapway, Idaho on a Nispers reservation. I grew up there um, and moved to Flagstaff, Arizona, where I live now with my family. Uh, I am an assistant professor. Um, I am also the associate vice president for Native American initiatives at Northern Arizona University. Um, I was a tribal archeologist for about 20 years. Um, and most importantly, I am my mother. I, um, like I said, I'm an indigenous woman and my experience and my motivation for what I do comes from that experience. Um, being a brown woman in, in a white world is something that is violent, that is unkind, um, and that prepares you for a life of struggle. Uh, 
Um, but that's, that's not to say that I would trade who I am and what I do for anything in this world. I am blessed to be who I am and to be in this very space right now. So I just want to express my appreciation for each of you who took the time to come here um, and who are watching online. So um, and something that kind of struck me as being very true, and now I'm kind of realizing that is what Corey said this afternoon or this morning of um, those who are meant to be here will be here. And so I just want to take you take the time to say thank you. Um, my work has been in the area of archaeology. Uh, that's the story that I tell to my colleagues at the university. Um, but my work as a cultural person, as someone who protects our lands and our people, started when I was born. Um, my father was a very culturally based man um, and who was very conflicted because of his upbringing as being half native and half white. And so it was something that he was constantly called out on, um, but he everything that he had in him was for his people, for his land, and for his other relatives, right? Our, our two-legged, four-legged, the insects, right? The water, earth, wire, earth, fire, water, and air are elements. Um, and so my father was very strong in understanding what it meant to be a Nimi Pu Hama, a Nez Perce man. And so he carried those responsibilities with pride, um, but it was also something that he taught to me. I had no idea that he was preparing me for a life of an archeologist um, as someone who fought for our homelands. But when, when I was little, uh, he was on tribal council for Nez Perce tribe and he was actually the cultural liaison which meant that he, anytime there was a call um, where there was something of history or culture, archeology, span anthropology, my dad had to go out there to wherever, right? And so he would often take me to these places and I would watch my dad argue with all of these different folks um, who, who were trying to tell him about his land and about his rights to the land. And so my dad was always very strong in believing that those rights that he maintained was really a relationship. And it was something that was given to him, gifted to him rather from his family, from his mother. Um, and so he took those responsibilities very seriously. And so part of what I learned in going on these trips was protocol. I learned songs, I learned prayers, I learned the the way that we have to be with one another and, and with the land and with our ancestors when we're doing the work that we have to. And so, I again, I didn't understand that what he was preparing me for was to be able to fight for our landscape, but also to bring our ancestors home. And so, again, within this, this academic space, I am a NAGPRA coordinator. I am someone who completes NAGPRA compliance for our university and our institution. Uh, when I worked for Navajo Nation, I was actually one of the people who went out to exhume folks if they were um, uncovered or exposed by extractive industry, road construction, um, any kind of like infrastructure development was the most most often when I when I would have to go out and take care of our ancestors. And so it was through that kind of work that I, I understood, again, what it meant to be a Dinehasa or a Nimi Pu'aya, a Nez Perce woman, a Navajo woman. And so as I went through my, my education, I found the most comfort in learning the rules and the regulations and the theories that were used against us as indigenous peoples to tell us who we are, to tell us where we came from, to tell us when we got to our homelands. And so I learned all of those things very easily. And it wasn't long before I was known as a troublemaker within academia because I could speak just the same as them. I could recall the policies 
but it was for me, it was a lot of fun because it was hundreds of years of anthropologists and archaeologists and historians telling us who we were, right? Defining who we were, defining our past, and yet not once sitting in ceremony or going out on the land to collect and to harvest, but yet they were the experts on who we are. And so I took a lot of pride in, in getting that piece of paper so that I have those two initials before my name. And it was only, the only reason I had to do that was because when I went into these spaces to advocate for our people and to say no to these different projects, I was a brown woman. And so people would tell me, well, we just need some more water here. We, I don't know where the snacks are. Where's the bathroom? I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I have the same question. And so, you know, it was, <laughs> it was always a shock on their face when I introduced myself as such. Because again, when you think of brown women and, and when, when the people in that room thought of brown women, we were the ones cleaning, we were the ones taking care of the building and there was no way that we could be at the same table. And so that for me was one of the motivations to do this kind of work. But it was also, again, like I said, growing up and seeing archeologists and anthropologists doing these dirty deeds, thinking no one would see it, no one would find out. It was the federal agencies who were telling my father that he couldn't, he couldn't hunt here, he couldn't fish here when he was just trying to sustain the, the community and feed us. And so all of these experiences of people telling us what we can and can't do, who we are, who we aren't, whether or not we're traditional, right? All of those things motivated me to be here, to, to be in these spaces, to advocate for our lands, our people, and our quote unquote resources, right? And so it's, it's been a long journey. It's, it's also the experiences that I have had, my sisters have had, my nieces, my cousins, my mom, my aunts, my grandmas. That's why I do the work here because no one speaks for them. No one speaks about the ex of what it means to be a brown woman in this world and the violence that accompanies that how we treat our land, how we, how we understand that relationship in, in our larger society is a reflection of all that's wrong with, with our, our society and where we are. And when we see these impacts to the climate, when we see our, our mother, right? Because that's our name for her in our language is mother. When we, we see our mother reacting in that way, we know things are wrong. We know shit is bad forgive me for, for that language, but that we know it. And so again, for me, the way that I was raised is that because of the, the violence and the abuse against our, our mother, it's women who stand up to help protect. It's women who have to be there for the most vulnerable because that's how we're taught. We're taught to take care of our youth, to take care of our elders, the children but that's because it's part of who we are, right? And, and for me, that, that's who I am. That's my responsibilities. And this is my heart work is doing this and protecting and fighting. And so, you know, that's, that's who I am. And, and, you know, that's what I hope to contribute in the conversation. So I appreciate again, your time and attendance and super blown away by everything that has been said. So looking forward. All right, Duranda, it's all you. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. How a man and Nani and Duranda Noa. Hi, my name is Duranda, and I'm Noa, or also known as Paiute Shoshone. Um, I come from the Northern Great Basin. If you don't know where that's at, it's this real big basin in the middle of Nevada, Oregon, Idaho. Um, and um, my people, um, I come from the band of the Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone tribe, and that's where I'm federally enrolled with. Um, but I have a, a lot of tribes and a lot of relatives from across the Paiute Shoshone and Bannock nations. And so um, my father, 
He's um, Paiute Shoni, and my mother, she is also Filipino, Swedish, and Danish. And so um, when I was growing up, I found a lot of my, my native side from my father. And so I, I feel you on that. <laughs> and my mother, um, I, yeah, she's Filipino and Swedish and Danish. And along the way, like I realized as I was growing up that those two, those people were tribal at one point and Filipino or tribal. And they too were colonized. And um, so throughout my, um, my childhood growing up, who I am now, I've had, a, I've had to find my way through those worlds. And so um, uh, I grew up in Reno, Nevada, and then I went off to college at um, Southern Oregon University. I got my bachelor's of science in environmental science and policy, where I was um, pushed the idea of green energy and renewable energy and never given the thought of what that's having to do or how extractive that whole side of the, the world is. And, and it was really uh, couldn't, uh, interesting how it all played out because my tribe is being um, threatened by a lithium mine. And lithium, if you don't know, is a mineral metal needed for um, making um, lithium ion batteries, solar panels, and you know being pushed as many um, climate scientists, climate activists for renewable energy. And so both sides of these extractive industries of fossil fuel extraction, as well as, you know, this whole idea of this green colonialism, um, it's pretty bad. And so I'm not affected by a too much fossil fuel extraction. Um, Nevada is known for mining, and that's where I kind of that's where I'm based out of right now. Um, but then we see the carbon offset and the carbon um, credits. Um, these mines having solar panels to help their um, their carbon uh, neutrality and net zero and whatnot. And so, as I was at school, I didn't really see that side. No one ever pushed me to that point of questioning um, the, the idea. And so that was really, really hard for me once I realized our tribe was threatened by uh, a lithium mine. And this lithium mine, it's um, the sacred site. It's an ancestral, part of our ancestral homelands. It's not on our reservation, but it's in between two parts of our reservation. We have one side that's on the north, the, our lithium mine. And then another um, part of our reservation that's a little bit south. And so um, it got its name, Behemaha. It's called, and it's translated into English as Rotten Moon. Um, and Rotten Moon is its first name um, when it got um, a massacre. And this massacre happened before written time. It was between our, our um, enemy tribe and our tribe. And so our people were massacred there from another tribe and um, it got its name. And then in 1865 is when our, our tribe um, and people, Western white settler colonialism was starting to happen. You know, reservations were in our area. Um, and it was August, 1865 is when the reservation Fort McDermott um, became a military post and that military post was rounding up the Indians. And um, no matter how they came, dead or alive, they were going. And not even a month later, um, that's when another massacre happened. And that was um, uh, September 12, 1865, the Calvary, they killed up to like 30 people of our tribe. And in that, in the, uh, the survivors, there was three known names, I'm not sure who else, you know, made it out. But in those three people, 
that's my great great grandfather and so if it wasn't for um his survivance then you know I wouldn't be here and so I think that's a pretty crazy story that you know our people were massacred at a point and now we're trying to fight for uh, their protection because their bodies their massacre site this area is being threatened for renewable energy um and so I too have um you know really strong side of um you know indigenous worldviews and you know how I'm supposed to live my life and I live that um I live that you know I don't second guess it um to me it's normal and so when I come to the city San Diego um because where I live is pretty rural um not too many people other than maybe some antelope and deer and bighorn sheep but um it's interesting interesting to see the norms here and connecting even though we're all from all different tribes we still have a lot of similar worldviews and um on basis and each tribe they've all have place-based knowledge um and so in a room full of people i don't know but i feel very at peace and feeling good um but i am here because i speak up for those who cannot and what i mean by that is i speak up for um, my elders that can't make it right here to talk to you. I speak up for my family who um, who all have these traditional views that also don't want this lithium mine, that want other places protected at, around our homelands. Um, our reservation's not that big, but we got a lot of places that are important to us. And so those aren't seen but you know, thank, thank cellular colonialism. But um, um, I also speak up for, you know, the plant people, our animal people, and um, we're on Kumeye lands. And so I just wanted to acknowledge um, these people as well. And that um, as I was checking out the coast, um, we had, a Kumie sign and it was talking about the indigenous people, but it was off to the side. It wasn't, you know, right where everyone was at. And I was thinking, you know, that'd be pretty cool if they had it right where everyone was at. That's the first thing they see. And I feel like a lot of times people are pushed, indigenous people are pushed, you know, out of the view for a little bit, just for a little bit, and then they'll then they'll be acknowledged. And sometimes that's how I feel with the lithium mine that's happening in my territory is that, you know, at school, at my university, I was pushed this green energy, I was pushed renewable energy, um, but who is it affecting? And that's the biggest part is, you know, the oil drilling and the, you know, coal mining, the copper mining, the cobalt mining, lithium mining, who is it affecting? Um, and sometimes we live our lives, you know, not giving a, a second think or a second um, thought about it. And that's, I feel like, is our problem, is that we live in a society that doesn't think past ourselves. Um, and so within our tribal nations and you know, at home and how we talk in our tribal communities, it's always about how is it going to affect, you know, our people here right now? How is it going to affect the people in the future, the people that are unborn? Um, and so that's how I'm trying to think about. That's what I want. Um, and so here we are, and that's why I'm here. And so I don't have as many experiences as the people before me, but I'm in the start of my journey. And so I'm glad to be here. Thank you.
Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, you know, we we have a, a some time here to have a conversation. You know, and that's what I'm I'm hoping we can start. But uh, I've had the microphone for this. I'm going to turn to Giorgio first. See if there's some questions you wanted to start with. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, everyone, um, for that insight, those experiences, and that wisdom. A uh, similar theme we saw across. Um, all of the, the the expressive discussions of these experiences is this idea of deep time knowledge, a deep time being looking far into the past and far into the future simultaneously. But I think there's also a question around extraction, and we can broaden that out more widely, the extraction of information, the extraction of knowledge, the extraction of traditional science systems. Um, and something I think being at San Diego State that we need to question is how are universities part of this process? There was a media theorist, I might be wrong, it may have been Guy Debord, but he said the power of media is not so much in what it shows, but in what it veils, in what it hides. I was hoping you guys could all speak to how what the media, or, or not what the media, but what the, what the university system hides, like Duranda was talking about. What is not taught? What experiences and what past and what futures? And how, in your experiences, do you see this elision of indigenous peoples, knowledges, experience, and informing science policy generally and more exactly climate science policy? I see Aura nodding. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I so. Um... Yes, all of those things, yes. Uh, so the answer is yes, they do have an active role in that. And that is the reason why I decided to move from tribal work. Well, that and many others, but other story. Um, <clears throat> but why I decided to move from working for my tribe to teaching. And basically, when I went to these meetings with federal agencies, local agencies, there was always a sense of paternalism, um, but also uh, misogyny, I think, was there was a, a layer of that that was part of all these other layers. Um, <clears throat> but there was also this idea, ideology maybe, that federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies, because they were scientists or because they were trained in science, right, in, at the institution, university, that they somehow had more knowledge than indigenous folks um, and that their knowledge base was valid and that it provided them with an objective view of the universe. And so that was always something very difficult to deal with when you're in one area trying to explain what this land means, what the, the culture that it holds, that it's part of who we are as indigenous peoples, it's our identity. And the only thing they wanna know is, <clears throat> so if we move the boundary like 30 feet, we'll be okay? No, 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 you're not okay. And so it was really this idea that there was always some way that you could fix or purchase or buy or um, mitigate the impacts of damage to a, a cultural place, a sacred place, right? And so at that point, we're speaking two different languages. And so most of the time it ended with us leaving the table completely upset and, you know, saying a lot of terrible things to each other. And so after many, 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 many meetings of that, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Maybe I need to go back and teach these young folks about how to actually do this work in a good way. And so what does it mean to, to decolonize CRM? What does it mean to decolonize the institution, right? And, and so for me, it was bringing the, the people into the classroom, because it's hard to debate people when you're hearing someone, an elder speak about their connection to a certain place, or when you're hearing stories that have been passed down from time immemorial about a particular location that to them is a place on the map that they can bisect and cut and, and do what they need to, and it won't impact any of these 
stories or these relationships that have been established since time immemorial. And so when you're hearing these things and you're connecting that way, it, it changes your mindset and the way that you view not only these, these places, but it, it's that relationality starts to, I don't know, manifest, I guess. And so you have a very different perspective of what the land means or of, of how people are connected to the landscape, how they maintain that connection. And so when you're, when you're actively creating those connections that the institution that Western science teaches us to sever through objectivity, right? That it, it becomes easier to divorce yourself from what it actually means to have a relationship with people, but also with a place. And so when you're, when you're trained to think about things through very monetized, sort of consumer-based way, then yeah, it's all consumable. We can always do something to bring things back. And so it's a mindset. It's a colonial mind frame that kicks in and never like works itself out. And so thinking about that, right? Why and how do we not learn these things? And it's because of this full non-critical acceptance of Western science, but also Western ideologies, right? And, and so we know that this kind of Western research paradigm is connected to colonization, and it is a way that the, the systems that it supports and creates are all the same systems that keep our, our communities oppressed, that sever our voices from, from management or from being at the table, and so it's a system that we uncritically accept. And so in order to break this or to change it, you have to wake people up from it. And just to say decolonial thought or decolonization, how many of you just kind of glazed over because that's a trend <laughs> word, right? And so, but when you, when you actually get to what it means, that's when it changes. And so I, I think, you know, coming from that perspective of, you're being force-fed all of these things, you also have to remember that that system, that Western research paradigm is a part of the colonization. And that's something that if you are not careful when you're going through school, you accept wholesale, especially as a scientist, right? You don't think about the impact. So something... <laughs> Sorry, something building off of that, which is very interesting, is he used a word, quote unquote, objective. And something I know the Zuni tribe has put forward to certain scientists, say in Glen Canyon, right? The Glen Canyon Adaptive Management Program is you're making that assertion, your objective, demonstrate through your own scientific methodologies, principles, standards, and logic how you're objective. You can't. You're making an assertion. You're not making a scientific statement. You're making you're making a, a, a normative statement. It's a value judgment and a value system. So there's a certain arrogance that goes along with this confidence that scientists and Western mainstream scientists understand reality in its totality. And this methodology can slow things down and extract invasively, violently through torture, not through loving care of deep time and deep space relationships, but through these extractive industries that are based on even if you read the, you know, the, the, the quote unquote father of mainstream Western science, Francis Bacon, it was based on misogyny and it was based on rape. This was language he used of how you extract this knowledge. So I'd like to turn it to Tino here and the arrogance being a land manager, wildlife manager, and dealing with the arrogance of scientists and this confidence that they know way more than you, right? <laughs> yeah, no, excellent words about academia and and I'll start there right because a lot of that arrogance comes from the academics and that and I think you know you and I've touched on it in past conversations is that indigenous knowledge is not sought and you know when I introduce myself I, I say I come from 10,000 years of land stewards right and all of that you know you heard in an earlier statement about living as part of an ecosystem uh, 
that doesn't work with colonialism. That doesn't work with settlement. That doesn't work with all these. So, so that academia tries to balance all of these things. And then, like you said, force feed us into it and do things that we know won't work. And I mean, we're dealing with uh, several species of, of salmon that are, that are now extinct. We have ESA listed salmon, all of those that came from degradation of, of ecology and extractive resources. Um, the other thing that I think, and, I, and I'm going to circle back to your, your previous question and where the institutions teach them, it, they teach them that indigenous knowledge, indigenous, all, indigenous interaction is procedural. It's not tangible. They're not looking for something. They're not looking for your grandfather's story. They're not looking for anything that we, we really have to give. They're looking for this checkbox procedural thing where then they can then talk at us. And, and it's uh, it, it's great because, and, and I gave this speech on the floor of, of one of the most sacred ceremonies that we have about it's a war of words and acronyms, right? And it's being waged on us. And it is, uh, it's up to us to, to now defend what we have in terms of management practices, in terms of consumptive use, in terms of, you know, because, it's it's a really weird balance where um, society has preservationist values, and they seem to align well with our conservation values, but they don't recognize the, the consumptive use values that that are that lead indigenous beliefs into sustainability, into models of sustainability, into where we can continue to perpetuate our existence, our our thought, our you know, incorporating every aspect of life into you know, I think you said it in your opening, a song, a dance, all of that, all of those come back and it's tough, right? Because the arrogance, in, and this is a world I walk, I, I get called by a legislator today that wants to talk about um, making a deal with, with the ag industry because that there, there's unacceptable in, impacts to their capitalistic ways by wildlife. They literally want to, and then this is again, a separation. Um, so the political element will drive, the management element will drive, uh, you know, and it all comes back to capitalistic beliefs and, and this colonial thought and marginalization of, of our community because our voices, we're willing to work with you. We're willing to work in harmony. We'll teach you how to, we'll help you. We'll do all of these things. And it's never, never enough. So I don't know, the land managers, the arrogance. Um, like I said, I, I think that all comes back to tribal engagement being procedural. And, and it's, we've been a checkbox uh, consultation for so long and systemically oppressed to where we start believing right that that checkbox that mitigation right and and the other thing is you know when you talk about managing we're seldom brought into a conversation in its infancy or in a planning phase we're brought into it at the mitigation phase we're brought into it when you know not we're going to take more we are taking more how can we mitigate and minimize the impact so um, I don't know. There, there's so much more in, in just classic examples of that. But I think that's the other thing is they don't, the system, the management system, the government agencies, the, the uh, departments, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all, all of them, they don't engage at early levels and they don't seek it. And I, I mean, I, I think back of a conversation a couple of days ago with my uncle who works in natural resources 40 years for the neighboring tribe, he literally said, what is traditional ecological knowledge and why are they seeking it now? And it, he's worked 40 years in this industry and they're just now asking him to bring some of his brilliance. I mean, the, the, he is you know, in his later years and he's absolutely brilliant, but that's it, right? It's all procedural. He's been through the process of check boxes. He knows that really well. He knows mitigation really well. He knows, you know, like the, um, you know, how, how, 
we've been taught how to be liability managers versus asset managers and the assets being natural resources. So it's just, it's, it's super frustrating. Like, as a, the, you know, as a natural resources manager, it, it's tough because you lose a lot of sleep at night, right? If you think of it from a capitalistic sense and you manage a hedge fund, how would you like to be losing all the time and talk to your, to your, clients and be like hey i lost more money I, but i i minimize this loss it's <laughs> never i mean that is a, an exact and so you lose a lot of sleep at night and uh and the flip side of it is is um i echo the words that were said earlier is i'm blessed to be in the conversation to try to change that and turn that tide so i'll stop there and i don't know so just to continue the, the thread of this conversation, um, first of all, I, I want to say that I'm relating hard to what you're saying. Now, I'm, I'm not Indigenous myself, but in my work as Paula's TIPO, as the Environmental Director, the TIPO, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, talk about the war of acronyms, NAGPRA, National uh, CRM, Cultural Resource Management, NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. <laughs> we, we do this so much, it becomes our natural Literally. language. But uh, I'm hearing you about the, the box checking operations. And the thing that I'm thinking about is, I, I, it seems to, I think a lot of people that what we're presenting here is a binary. Either we keep things the way they are in the current capitalist system or we die. Um, you know, that there's no in between. We either extract the lithium and the cobalt and all those minerals to turn away from greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels, or we go extinct. And I don't think that's the only answer. And I don't think that anybody up here thinks that that's the only answer. But in terms of putting that into the perspective of the institutions that are teaching our future to manage these problems, I'd like to hear, um, Mike, specifically from you, because you are back in the academic realm as a student. What have been your experiences and what do you think we could be doing differently? Wow, that's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> you got a big brain. I think you can handle it. I, I have been... It, it's been a while since I, I was, uh, I actually, I taught at, here at San Diego State for a while and, and uh, but it's, uh, it's interesting to, to go and be on the receiving end. And, um, and, and there were a lot of things that, that really were pleasant surprises for me. Um, the idea of, of science as being this objective truth seeking field has been upended. Um, critical science studies have gone in and, and they've shown how scientists from the procedures in the lab to the to the to the the things that they're researching, how there's all these these biases and influences that 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 affect what is going on there. Um, there's more openness to other ontologies, other points of view. Uh, all in, in many fields, and and uh, and this has been growing over the last uh, twenty or thirty years. But but there were there's still a lot of professors that have that are from the old school, and so we we have this interesting time. There 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 are fewer and fewer of them, but there there are still some from that school of thought that uh, you know I'm the scientist, I have the PhD, therefore I know. Not only do I am I the expert on this. But I also know how best to it should be portrayed. I, the historians that feel that they're the best one to tell your history because they're a historian. They have a PhD in history. They know how to say it. They know how to tell it. Uh, or the anthropologist or the ethnographer that comes in and says, "I, I know, I know your, pe I know your people better than you do because I'm objective. I'm a scientist." And um, and. and it's been all of these have been analyzed and 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 have been taken apart and there's so much more now there's places where people are going in and actually looking at the at these procedures looking at the way the scientists are portraying things and they're going back and revisiting a lot of the old studies that that have been done that have been the foundational documents for for a lot of these things and even going back into the into the 19th century and some of the some of that foundational work and saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, there are these other 
these other ways of looking at these things and, and let's, let's follow that forward. Um, one, uh, uh, when one of the introductions I had to, to bias in, in science was um, uh, Judith, Judith Butler's uh, uh, writing on the egg and the sperm. And uh, I, you know, always had this picture from when I was really young and I'd read science books that the sperm just wiggled his way in there and just boom, <laughs> impaled the, impaled the egg. And, uh, and she, you know, the passive egg just, you know, ah, you know, <laughs> got, got fertilized and, uh, and then, you know, mitosis and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and, and man, it's not like that at all. That's, that's a, a, uh, a male bias that goes into the description and there's just so much the egg is actually the in control of this process and and uh you know it latches on to the the tail of the sperm and it, and the sperm doesn't actually impale the egg it bangs its head against it until it bashes its contents out and the <laughs> egg transports it i mean it's just so so different than what i thought it was but so why did this get embedded into what we learn, you know, from a very young age that, uh, that it's like that. And, it, and it's this orientation that we, that we, that we see in science that, uh, um, you know, I, I, it, it's great to see people critiquing and visiting, visiting and revisiting these things. It, it's caused problems um, for a lot of people in our society, I, I think, because they, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, they, they only take a part of it. They say, oh, look, these scientists don't know what they're talking about. And they just latch onto that and it becomes a, a kind of a mantra for them to, to, uh, to ignore science that, that actually, you know, does have, you know, is legitimate, is, is being done as objectively as possible. But I think e even within, within these concepts, we're seeing the, the, the recognition that that you don't hear even the scientists you don't hear them claiming that they are absolute objective or that they have absolute truths it's it's um um they are making putting qualifiers on on more of their stuff now and uh and they're recognizing the fact that there are these biases that come in we have you know we we have in indigenous knowledge we have our biases that, that come in, but we've never shied away from it. That's part of who we are and part of our perception of the world, and we're and we recognize that and we're happy with that. And um, so, who had the greater truth then? The ones who ignored their biases and pretended to have ultimate truth, or the people whose scientific knowledge had biases which they recognized and. Uh, uh, and, and utilize in, as a part of their process. So um, it gives you an, uh, just another another way of perceiving. So I I could go on and on, but uh, <laughs> did, is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that's a wonderful transition into a question some of us have talked about, Mike, and that's what you sort of named as biases, right? It's very interesting because I come from the geography department where we go everywhere from French post-structuralist feminine philo feminist philosophy to hardcore, hard, quote unquote, scientists. And those in the quote unquote, hard scientists still like to fancy themselves as objective, right? And so it's interesting what you said, because if you go to like the neurosciences or physicists, they'll be like, yeah, there is no objectivity, but then you get economists and archeologists and they like to think they're objective, right? Um, but something you touched on that I think is so fundamental for people to recognize is in mainstream Western knowledge production system, it's based on a methodology that denies its metaphysics as if it's just a natural understanding of the world where indigenous knowledge systems embrace the, the, the metaphysics, the philosophy and methodologies and how they work together. So with that, I want to pose a question to both Edward and Duranda with your background in science. And Edward, I know you've you've talked about this and written about this, but what are very often portrayed as Zuni religious beliefs, I know you've said from another standpoint, you can see it's a science system. 
Um, can you share sort of the, the deep time, deep space of Zuni sciences through experimentation, through observation, and how that sort of has come about as a science um, that embraces itself as a philosophy? Can we um, project one of my photos? Uh, well, basically both, both photos. Hurry up, Sam. <laughs> so um, let me open by trans um, talking about the burning of the Amazon. The international world witnessed the burning of the Amazon jungle. And um, we talked about the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we also talked about Benjamin Rand's um, international court. Well, even though um, we have such mechanisms that we couldn't, we couldn't stop the fires in the Amazon jungle. The Amazon jungle, the lungs of the world. And um, when, when, when such a magical place is destroyed, it's not gonna come back. It's, it's not gonna regenerate itself to what it was. And um, I'm sure that when the jungle was burned, all the place names that helped the indigenous peoples navigate through the jungles were lost. I imagine that's, that's the same way that insects, once their habitat is destroyed, the indigenous have a hard time navigating from place to place. And so there is these dynamics, a lot of it that we don't understand, a lot of it that we don't see because we're going down to very small things that we cannot see. I mean, just to look at how an ant survives in the underworld, that's, that's ants are incredible architects and, and so on. So, in that reference, coming from the Ashwe Nation, as, as an activist and now a tribal council person, in fact, those two don't work. Um, I look at the watershed, for example, or the watersheds. We talked about, I talked about the checkerboard area. And let me use one particular site, for example, the um, Zuni Salt Lake, where the salt mother lives. It's a volcanic crater within a volcanic crater. And the outer larger volcanic cra crater encompasses about a mile square. And so when you think about protecting these sites, but the, the, the state of New Mexico only gives you the mile square. Outside it is private lands. Outside, you're, you're dealing with the Chicago board area. How do you maintain the health of that wetland, that sacred site? When we look at a watershed, whether it's in New Mexico, whether it's in um, Colorado, when we look at a watershed, and we start thinking in our modern terms of, told you, you mentioned, not checkerboarding, but just, just how we break up Mother Earth. In an in indigenous sense, when we look at a watershed, this watershed is connected to this watershed. This watershed is connected to other watershed. The waters are one body, we call it the water spirit. It's, it's one body, just as much as Mother Earth is one body. Scientists, I guess we're so eager to just destroy the Earth and move on, because if you look at science, they said there's no water. There, there, water hasn't been found in the solar system. So we know that. And if that's the case, 
common sense says, let's take care of this rare element called water on earth. So looking at those dynamics and going to really something that is very concrete. And I'll go to um, the 1930s. I mentioned that my people, we do a, every four years, we, we make a two day pilgrimage to the sacred site of Hattinkaya, Whispering Springs. It's the springs where the children, they sing out. When you're, that's why it's called Whispering Springs, Hattinkaya, is because that's where the singing comes out. Well, that sacred site was um, suffering from degradation in the 1930s. Eventually, this sacred spring, Satinkai, Whispering Springs, it died and it's never coming back because that's how degraded that, that ecosystem is. There's, there's no balance anymore. The river, Colorado River, the little Colorado River has been diverted, dammed, and everything else. And the, even the river channel, the little Colorado River channel doesn't even have its own rights because I know that because I heard that in the courts. We're saying that, well, can't we have water come down to, to so the river channel can have some of its water set? Nope, not unless it's practicable, irrigable acreage. Only when it's farmland waters, then it can be released. But it wasn't, it can't be released just to make sure that the the, the corridor of the Colorado River quenches its thirst. That's 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 the big difference. And so in the 1930s, when my, my people made the two-day foot pilgrimage to the sacred springs of Hattinkaya. They saw that there were no cattails, there were, there were very little willows, there were no turtles or anything. And um, really, we, when we do our pilgrimages, we, we collect cattails, we collect willows. In the ceremony, going back to the village, during the uh, summer solstice, when the pilgrims come in, the Zuni people, they witness the cattails. They see the willows, they see the turtles being brought in. The turtles and willows are a testament that there's still a healthy eco ecological balance at Whispering Springs. Well, that hasn't been the case for many years. Because in 1930, when they saw degradation, the, the word was sent to Washington, D.C., asking for help. That, that, that in that period, before climate change was coined, Zuni saw that the mighty Little Colorado River was, was drying up. So nothing happened. And so in the 1980s, we, 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 we went to court to settle the Zuni heaven water settlement, the Zuni heaven, the places, the place where children's lives were lost at the confluence of the Zuni River and the Little Colorado River. I was in the courtroom for five years. We finally settled in 2003. In hindsight, I just, I just regret the fact that we never talked about climate change as part of the equation in the water settlement. After we settled, these adverse weather patterns became more obvious. And, and so now the agreements that we have are, are not fully implementable because there's no water. There's not a, no water to be released to the Zuni heaven. Even the ranchers are not seeing the water. And so, so again, in the 1930s, my, my pilgrims, my religious leaders in a ceremony which is not considered science in Western or modern terms, I guess, but it's still science to us because we, we collect plants. When we, we, when we know that those plants aren't there, there there's not just a super, superficial impact, but deep down, the earth is drying up. And lakes, rivers give us a dimension that we take for granted. Our river died in, in, in I guess, the mid 
I guess around 1950s, our rivers start disappearing. Our river used to be healthy. I, I'm, I'm the last generation that grew up with the, with the river. I'm the last generation that swam and fished in the river. It's gone. When the river is gone, the, the subsurface flows, disappears. Trees die off. Your children, like my grandchild here, she doesn't know how to swim. She's, she's never had, had a chance to play with the water or mud. When, the, when a river is gone, when a lake is gone, you lose that dimension. You might call it fourth dimension. I call it fourth dimension because you understand what I think I means, right? It's where the spirit of the children live in that Hadigai. So there's that added dimension. It's not just a water. It's not just a spring. That the spirit of the water lives there. It's, it's being at two places at once. You, as, it's, as our abstract name is children of corn. As children of corn. Corn is our life way. But corn is also our spiritual life way too. Water is also a spiritual life way. When we die, we become part of that water world. We become the water spirit. I think scientists, in, in science, if you look at a human body, I think we're 98% water. So it's no different. We, even, even this daylight time, we are still the water spirit. So we're looking at life after death, the place of regeneration as that Hatinjaya, whispering springs. That has an additional dimension because the spirits live there. And as a person living in this daylight time, we're living both afterlife and present time. So there's that dimension that we don't look at. And so therefore, when we talk about water and, and the lack of water, we look at well, let me take a step back. I grew up with a river that had leopard frogs. My granddaughter doesn't know what a leopard frog is. As an individual that grew up with the river, I could name plants. I could, I, I had a vocabulary. I have a vocabulary for wetland plants. I have a vocabulary for wetland obligated species, turtles, etowa, mutulika. What are little frogs called? Tadpoles. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I don't have a vocabulary in English for water plants, but anyway, you lose all that. And let me tell you what, what a healthy ecosystem is. And we know because we protect Salt Lake and you can go to Zuni Salt Lake. Remember the crater within the crater? You go there, and you can collect salt. You go down in the water, you, you find salt. You go deeper in, you find what you call hetesha. Um, it's the black mud, I think it's called humus. The Zunis take that black mud, hetesha, because hetesha is the most fertile soil that you can find in a wetland site. We take this black mud and we bring it home and we take our ears of corn with it and we put it into the seat rooms. It's a sign of fertility. Corn, an ear of corn with humus. Regeneration, right? And as human beings, when we get to that point where we transition to life of regeneration, as a Zuni, I hope you, you have this opportunity as well in your own beliefs that you become part of something greater and who we are, that we become the water spirit. Because remember, there's no place in the solar system that we know that has water. Um, and yeah, just to go off of you, water, water, water is life, right? Um, and so I also uh, forgot to mention that I do teach um, junior high and high school science classes with um, an elective of indigenous studies. And so I have a really cool opportunity to 
teach a handful of students just these concepts that maybe they've never heard before, right? Um, things that all of us have um, talked about um, just to push that idea that, you know, um, academia doesn't actually give us um, that, that second thought, that rethought about things. And so, yes, water is life. And in that class, I, I talk about how um, we live in a high desert area. Um, water is precious. Um, you don't see a lot of water, but we also are in the Great Basin. In the Great Basin, a lot of the times, um, the water doesn't go to the ocean because it's a basin, <laughs> right? Excuse me. <laughs> Speaking of water. <laughs> um, and so in this class, Um, we talk about how at one time we were salmon people, and um, <laughs> maybe I could come back to yeah, this. Yeah, while you while you uh, uh, soothe your throat, um, I I just want to say to Mike that um, women we've always known that the egg is the strong one in the relationship. <laughs> But uh, you know, I'm glad that Judith Butler made that made that clear. <laughs> no, it's my turn. But I think you raise a really important point there, Shas, in relation to what Mike was saying. Is science in mainstream Western science, it has been extremely paternalistic and a masculine way of understanding and engaging the world, right? Through this dominant Western tradition where the fe the feminine has been the earth, the masculine has been reason and rationality and the transcendent, the feminist, right, the feminist has been, the, the feminine has been the body, the masculine has been the mind. So women have always known that, but science has been predominantly masculine in its approach, right? And that goes back to Francis Bacon and, and, and Earth Mother and it literally he was speaking through misogynistic and rapist terms in what science is supposed to do this was you know the the creator of the modern research institution and when we speak of these dead old white guys it's not as a dead old white guy it's as a conceptual persona it's what concepts are these names expressing and conveying and this this influence of francis bacon and what's emerged through modern institutions san diego state universities it's very, very um, paternalistic and masculinist, and it's very much about control. And Audrey Lord has talked about this, the tools of the master's house, right? And I know, Aura, we've talked about Audrey Lord's work, and part of her argument is that there are feminine or, or female scholars that feel the only way to get a voice heard is to work through those tools of the master's house. And her point is that'll never bring liberation. Right. And so we see this and it brings me back to and this is perhaps a question. I, are you are, is your throat see the right that I can bring back to you? And this is something right now that I'm working with Edward and um, Kurt Dungoski, the, the Zuni Tippo and the Zuni on. And that's the scientific programs that say we're the only ones who have the knowledge, native people. Ashiwi other native tribes who have affiliation to the Grand Canyon. And here's our science. Let us know what you think of it. And you need to speak in our terms. And really what it is is an epistemological other form of Pratt's mission in the United States to kill the Indian, save the man. But now it's just meant, you know, through the mind, right? Oh, if you practice our science, then you'll be saved where it's just doing more violence, more damage, more alienation. And so I I think that can transition back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, um, to the salmon um, or agai. And um, how we got our salmon was from the Columbia River, which connects the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then it was down through the Snake River, which goes through Idaho um, and then all the way through Wyoming. And uh, that was our part of our ancestral homelands. And I tell my students that at one time we were salmon people, um, a part of other things as well. And they're like, oh no, no way, we're in the high desert. But that was taken from us, that was removed from us. And so I'm um, trying to re um, put or reincorporate these ideas back in our head and um, 
as well as get those stories from other people who have that knowledge is really important. And so, um, uh, and then I also tell them through these waterways that we had this salmon and this, this, um, this substance, we also were connected to other people as well, other nations along this huge Columbia Snake River, Owyhee River. Um, and those are the things that connect us. And if you think about all those tributaries and all those places, it it's beautiful because it, it, it leads us one to another, one to another. And so, um, and, and back into um, the science part of it, I, when I was going to school, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a hydrologist. That's what, I, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and through time I took the hydrology class, I was like, no way, There's, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> and so um, it wasn't until my third year where I got into restoration ecology um, and um, doing the labor of restoring an ecosystem back to its, um, its healthy, um, thriving, uh, historical, um, uh, where it should be, right? Before colonialism, before it was extracted, before it was damaged or destroyed. And so um, those ideas, I was like, yeah, I like that. I want to do that. I think that's where I want to keep pushing myself into. And so that led to a, um, an internship with um, Loma Kotsky Restoration Project, who um, their main goal is to uh, incorporate traditional ecological knowledge of the indigenous people from that region that we were lived in to Western science and connecting uh, on the ground and indigenous people to you know these inner agencies right us forests blm um and so forth and so i thought that was just perfect right you got the science part of it but you also had someone who is putting forward traditional ecological knowledge indigenous knowledge ahead of that and incorporating that because that is probably the best way to interweave these kind of practices and management uh, management practices. And so um, it felt like the best of both worlds, right? I took the stuff that I learned from academia and then I also had the job um, and um, my indigenous side who I felt like, you know, it agreed with my morals. It agreed with my, how I was taught to live um, and then practicing it, right? We talk about climate change and climate change, yes, but what is the root source of climate change? It's humans, it's human destruction or extraction and um, our corporations and these big companies throwing up these, uh, these emissions, um, polluting the air, destroying habitat, you know, um, obliterating groundwater. Um, through mining and extraction. And so all these practices are, are um, happening and it's, it's easy to say climate change, but in reality, like I like to say the harsh truth, it is, it's us, right? It's that we could go the storm by anything we want at any time. It could, it's um, the idea of extractivism that, um, you know, it's in this society of like patriarchy and colonialism, and we could take, 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 take as much as we want without thinking about what's behind us, what what happened after we took. And so um, we see that also with indigenous communities with missing and murdered indigenous women, two-spirit girls, people, and it goes back to that taking culture. It goes back to, you know, um, all these natural resources are things that we are able to extract or can use for our own good to profit from. But then it goes back to these ideas, what's happening to in these indigenous communities as well. Um, those social aspects that are gonna be happening, but also, you know, back to water. And um, at this lithium mine, once it's going full on, there's 1.3 million gallons of water being pulled out of the, um, the ground and pumped through the, the mining process a day, a day, okay? 
And I don't, I'm not sure if you know how much water that is, but it's a lot. And if you've ever been to my, my area, my home, my ancestral homelands of the Great Basin, of the Sagebrush Steppe, it is dry. There's not a lot of water. There's not these rivers gushing with water. There's not, you know, the ocean or whatnot. There's a lot of groundwater. And to me, it feels real rude that these corporations can take this groundwater, this ancient water that's been in the ground for so long, um, and they can take it just like that while there's tribal communities out there that are still struggling for clean water, places around the world that are struggling for clean water. And so um, as we talk about you know, science and um, our traditional knowledge, there is a lot of things that we can learn from our traditional knowledge into our science world. Um, and that I think that's why I liked restoration ecology. It was like actually being able to do something about it, right? Or seeing the effects of climate change, how it could, um, you know, those rivers aren't going, those springs, those creeks are not flowing anymore, which affects all those plants, all the medicine it affects the animals that are in that region. And so um, when we have uh, threats like that within our communities and the water's not there, it feels as if that it's cultural genocide at some point. Um, so without the water, without these indigenous knowledges of these places or springs that happen every um, um, winter time or something of that sort, uh, this place-based knowledge, we might lose that um, within that time. And so that's why I'm a real big advocate for um, indigenous knowledge and pushing these indigenous people in these decision-making processes, having these opportunities to talk within tribal communities as well as in um, universities because it needs to be known. A lot of people don't get to hear this. And so, um, yeah, connecting these, these science philosophies to indigenous knowledge is really important. All right, thank you everybody for your, your great uh, responses. Um, I, I personally have a, a, a million different follow-up questions bubbling through my head. This has been a great conversation and, and it's not over, uh, but I just want to cue our audience to start thinking about some questions that you may have because we are going to transition soon into a Q&A opportunity. And uh, please don't be shy and think about what you want to hear from our, our great panelists. Um, I have a terrible question that is not answerable, so I'm going to give it to Giorgio because he probably has a question that's more answerable than than mine, but I, I just want you to think about this in case we come back to it, which is, uh, I, I have a, a very dear friend. She works at NAU. Her name is Anne Marie Chastilly, and she used to run the Institute uh, for Tribal Environmental Professionals, and now she's like vice provost of cool stuff, vice president of cool stuff. Um, I'm sure that's the technical title, but she's she's an amazing woman. And in all the work she's done on climate change, she's been a huge inspiration to me. And one thing she always says when she speaks to groups is uh, she talks about climate hope and what we can leave people with as a way to not feel completely like there's nothing we can do. So, you know, Giorgio has a more specific question, but I'm hoping that each of you might have a word of climate hope to give us when before we go to audience questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, just building off what Shasta said, and I guess, you know, my transition would be um, a line from one of my favorite philosophers, there, there is no reason to fear or hope, but only look for new weapons. And I think when we're thinking of um, certain large um, organizations like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or if you look at UN groups on climate change, there's still this dichotomy of humans versus nature or culture versus nature. Um, and it's sort of, they create these abstractions to understand things, but to confuse their abstractions and fictions for reality. And so on that, that line of hope and perhaps new weapons for productive, regenerative difference, um, maybe we can go down the line from Tino down and just offer a couple of words on 
what fundamentally needs to change from your perspective, from your experience, knowledge, and science base for a productive future inclusive of different pasts to come to be? Okay, I'll be, I'll be brief because I do want to hear some, if there's any audience, but uh, last week I was on a panel where, where the subject was a problem with, uh, with the agricultural and the, and the wildlife community. And I, I'll just share this quote that I, I shared with them. I said, I asked a, a decision policymaker at, at the state level, I said, please don't pose this as a problem. I said, coexistence is a dilemma and, and the answer is a balance. And so in that, I think uh, there's a lot of flexibility back to what Shasta said, you know, it's not doom and gloom. If we can find that balance, um, we can coexist. So, so that's my message of hope. Um, I hope that that resonates, and and I hope that as you guys transition into the decision making world, you can carry that. You know that coexistence is not a problem, but a balance. Oh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I hope uh, I hope that I can, you know, I I I, I always wanted to to try to stay as open as I could to um, to not withdraw, and I know there are people in the indigenous community who just don't want to deal with people outside of the community. They they've um, they've had enough. They they say forget it. They, you know whatever we do, they're gonna it's gonna be twisted, distorted, or used against us. And um, and I I I just you know I I don't want to be that way. And I want to I'll keep trying. And and I've found people in in the outside community that are also trying. They're they're working. They're they're trying to overcome their own inherent biases and their own. Uh, colonial way of thinking and, and colonial way of thinking is not just people outside of the world. We have our own, we, we ourselves many times are, are, are thinking in a, in a colonized way. So it's something we all have to ever overcome both inside and outside and, and, uh, and come to the realization of where there's these, uh, these commonalities that we can move forward. And, and so I will keep trying and, and I hope that uh, people here and on and the zoomers will uh will also uh keep trying and i think we can get somewhere then a couple of things one um let's think in terms of canary in the coal mine behind me was <laughs> Sam? <laughs> I met Sam. He, he helped me navigate the campus, so I got to be nice to him. <laughs> so um, my second painting is the um, endangered snow leopard. So we have to think in terms of canary in the coal mine. If we don't control the world banks, if we don't control governments that are creating a realistic development, we're gonna to continue to just devastate our climate. And so consider the endangered snow leopard as, as a beacon, as a beacon of hope. If we can protect its habitat, the Himalayan mountains, we can, do great justice for humanity. And again, the animals out there, they're our friends and they are a part of us. And so basically, if you're wondering what the writing is, look at the dollar bill. The writing's on dollar bill, you can look it up and it'll tell you what it means, but um, we can't put dollar ahead of human life. Dollar is just a tool. Money is just a tool. We can use it wisely or we can use it in a very erroneous way. 
So think about that. And one of the most uncomfortable things that I think is it, 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 most uncomfortable thing, at least for me, is to talk about um, overpopulation. And I much rather have the um, Dooney prophecy, the Ashwi prophecy, talk about overpopulation. And I mentioned earlier that we have to live within our means. If we're running out of water, if we're running out of ag lands, where we force ourselves to start dealing with the lungs of the world, then we are in grave danger and um, we are. We're, we're at the point where we can save ourselves or we just fall into the abyss. <clears throat> really, really good words, I think. And, and I think for me, um, you know, I'm just thinking about this idea of the canary in the mind, right? In the mind, and in the mind, um, and and the idea or the history and the experience of indigenous folks, and we have always served as the canary for um, the U.S. government, and so it's interesting to me to see how we have shifted. And we haven't shifted all the way to a 180, but we're, we're getting closer, I think. But it's been this idea that, you know, as indigenous peoples, we have, we're incapable of complex thought, um, that we always needed the government to be our, our patron, to take care of us. We're seen in the United States as the ward of the United States government. And so, in thinking about that, that the, the government has come and saved us, they've, they've helped us with our, to survive to this point, right? <clears throat> Albeit it was their policies and their action against us that put us in this situation. So, but when we look at that dynamic and think about everything that they've put us through and we're still here, this day and age, we still have our language, we still have our culture, our practices, we still know our prayers and our ceremonies that connect us to the landscape. And it's through that knowledge that has finally, I don't, well, it's that knowledge that has finally been accepted as a way out of the situation. But it wasn't until we showed that we were the resilient ones. We had the ability to survive. And now it's the government that's the canary in the mind because they're experiencing these things. They're seeing these things that we've spoken for, for years. We've had these prophecies. We've had our stories. We, we've understood what was going to happen to us before we could even, before we even had words for it, right? And so now we're in a position where the government is calling on us. We see... But, uh, President Biden's memo about TEK and the use of TEK in agency policies and agency actions. But it, now we're at a point of, how do we do that? How do we use your knowledge to save us? Well, tables have turned, haven't they? Because now we do have that knowledge. But the thing about it is that we're here. We're here showing up to share that knowledge. We're here providing a way forward. And we, we've never withheld that knowledge or that hand. It's always been there. But it's always been, we have been trampled down. We have been put into places that they thought we wouldn't survive. And yet those places are now producing all of the things that they want. And so now, because of the what we've been through, what we've experienced, and what we've prepared ourselves for 200 years ago, right? Because this idea of the seventh generation, that's what we are living our lives by. And so in all of the decisions that we make and that our ancestors have made, it's always been with that idea of what's gonna happen for the future? Where are our kids going to be? What are they gonna have to deal with? And so now, right, we have had the forethought to think about what we're going to do to survive in the face of settler colonialism. And so again, now 
looking at everything, we're, we're shifting and the government is that canary and they finally see those things. And for me, I see the hope in being able to have these conversations with you all because we, we know how to enact our knowledge and our protocols in a way that they were meant to be in the community, in the land, on the land. And so now we're, we're also having to grapple with how do we scale these practices up to help people and landscapes that have been, the, the connections have been severed for us. So now how do we deal with that? How do we expand that knowledge to help other people? And so for me, that's where the hope lies is there at that sort of margin or the intersection there of where we've been put and where we've had to survive and we've created this livable space now. And so how do we share that information, right? And, and for me, it's folks like you who are willing to listen to what we have to say to not only our critiques, but also of the ways that we have done this work for, for generations. And so if we're going to tackle this problem, it has to be together, but it also has to be without arrogance. It has to be without ego, and it has to come from a heart, your heart, right? You, you, my people believe that when you speak from your heart, do things from your heart, it's going, it's going to result, uh, produce good results. And so nothing bad can come when you speak from your heart. And so that's the work that we have to do. So now it's a shift for, for non-Indigenous peoples to understand what it means to do that work from the heart. And so it's up to you all to learn how to live that life through heart work, through service work. Um, and so for me, that's where the hope lies. So. Um. So climate hope, um, I know. And for me, it's a little bit uh, a little bit different because I feel so pinpointed with uh, these green economies being pushed towards us. Um, and so there's there's some problems. Um, I mean, we can get to you know colonialism, capitalism. For us to continue our economy, we have to continually buy, 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 right? Back to the taking culture, living a very nice life. We live a nice life, no matter what's going on in, in our worlds. Um, you know, to wake up in San Diego in a beautiful climate, in a nice home, or, you know, be able to drive our car, we live very nice. And, um, and so, I also am a part of a group um, of tribal descendants of my of my tribe, and we got together, and it's called People of Red Mountain or Tsagorakwa Winua, and we were fighting against the Thacker Pass lithium mine that's in our area, and also just protecting, you know, traditional knowledge within our area. We have a lot of elders that sit on this board or committee group, collective group, and um, they share a lot of knowledge. And so at a point in time, they're like, yeah, we trust you. You you talk. You're a good talk. You could talk good. And so I was put in a position where I had to take a lot of interviews because, you know, people going against green energy, against um, renewable energy, why, right? And so I was putting these positions and a lot of these interviewers always sprung the question, so what do we do next? What is our solution? And I looked at them and I'm like, what do you mean what's the solution? I mean, there's a bunch of climate activists and you know people that get paid big, big money for this. Why don't you go ask them? People have been studying this for a long time, right? but they wanna hear it from my voice. Um, and I never had a really good answer for them and it always pissed them off. Um, and I really had to get down to, you know, the fact that what I just mentioned with the taking culture, um, we live nice lives and, you know, we're taught this from a very 
early age with manifest destiny and the live the American dream. People come here to live the American dream. Um, you know, buy the new house, build the house from the top, you know, whatever else. And so, um, and that's, that's our problem, right? And I told these people, these interviewers that to, you know, stop climate change or mitigate it at some point is to, you know, stop living the way that we live. And, and if that makes you uncomfortable, it should, because it makes me uncomfortable, right? It's a very uncertain future that we're not ready for. And that's the reality of it. And that's why we push these green economies, solar panels, wind turbines, hydroelectric, um, nuclear power, um, all these other things, right? Because it's for us to sustain our lives and live it the way it is with putting a really nice name to it. And so that's, that's the part that makes me angry, right? We could continue our, our missions and continue our contamination, pollution as ourselves, but also these, these big industries and corporations and, and be okay with polluting, right? And it's just pretty tough. Um, so I'm always like the pessimist on like the whole climate hope thing, right? Um, <laughs> and, but it, we live in a bubble, we do. And everyone in this room thinks very, maybe similar, not all the same, right? If we're all the same, it's, you know, probably not good. Um, but we think similar, right? But we're in this bubble right here. We want to hear from everyone up here. We want to know these things about traditional ecological knowledge and everything that you've all experienced. But what about people out there? And that's that's hard, right? Not a lot of people want to hear this. And it because it makes us uncomfortable. It brings up colonialism, brings up capitalism, it brings up, you know, all these hard things that people aren't taught um, and are pushed into these systems, right? Like sheep. Um, and I've be always been the black sheep, I guess. So <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to say because I don't know if there's a just transition. Um, you know, before I realized there was lithium mining in the United States, like, I didn't care. I didn't know, right? But look at Chile, look at Bolivia, look at Australia, look at all these other places that are being extracted for lithium. And then on top of that, all the other minerals and metals that need to be mined on top of this, and you got now I got to ask you the question is it right to can extract more to mine more out of our climate crisis i'm not sure if you guys ever been to a mine or an open pit mine or anything of that sort but it is dirty it is nasty and it's not pretty and nevada has a lot of it um and so Sustainability, I really hate that word, I really do. Um, and it's hard to put a term on it, right? Sustainability, how are we gonna be sustainable? But we gotta, again, look at um, population and how we're living our lives and, um, and all of that good stuff. And so this renewable energy, these green, um, green energy, green economies, clean energy, whatever you want to call it, same thing, okay? It's climate injustice, truly. Um, and if you don't believe it, then you look more into it and educate yourself because um, what they want to do with lithium mines, what they're doing with Oak Flat, if you know what that is, Apache Stronghold, they're pushing indigenous, um, religious, religion, all that, all these sacred sites out the door. They don't care. Whatever happened to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, like that. But we are on indigenous places, United States of America and Central America, South America, and yeah, all of it, right? And all across the globe. And we don't even have the freedom of religion in our own homelands because they need to be extracted to live our nice lives. 
And so to me, climate hope is hard, but I really do think we need to pull away from our greedy economies. We need to be able to replace that bad economy for something that's more of a holistic approach, more of indigenous knowledge, more traditional ecological knowledge, and putting indigenous people's voices first in the decision-making processes um, because they have place-based knowledge. They've done this for many, many, many years, right? Since time immemorial. Um, and so we need to look at those kinds of things. And yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll just uh, first uh, say sorry for the whole hope thing. I, I get it. You know, you're you're taught you don't want to leave your audience just feeling like there's there's right. nothing they can do. But I want to say what gives me hope and everything you just said that everybody has said today gives me hope because it's a new way of thinking, actually an old way of thinking that I think is being reintroduced to people who have lost it. And so the fact that you all are here and that you are saying these things as a, you know a young leader and activist and that you all are here with your experience and knowledge, that gives me hope that we can make that, get closer to that just transition. So I think even words saying we don't have a lot to be hopeful about are still hopeful words because they're, they haven't been said, but they're being said now. So uh, with that, do, do we we have questions? Yes. Okay. So Corey, do you have a runner who can run our microphone so our Zoom folks can hear? It? I'll do it. I'll do it. That's all right. <laughs> okay. He needs to get up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, why did I come here today to learn? And I most certainly did. I learned about you know traditional ecological knowledge and, and rock drop structures and fire management, but I'm trying to think about what I really got. What you helped me do is feel the wisdom, because the way in which you shared, you had the generosity of sharing, the heartfelt generosity of sharing, um, made me feel the wisdom, and I can't thank you enough for that. And where I'm coming from, I come from a privileged place. Uh, the University of California, San Diego. I've been teaching there for 34 years. And uh, I'm a big fan of science, but science is broken for the reasons that you're describing. We're not gonna science our way out of this unless we bring the demos back into science, the will of the people. But I also hear, well, what people? You know, we've lost the indigenous voice in what's going on. So I'm actually gonna lead up to a, a question here I wanted to ask you about sort of governance, because what I've tried to do, uh, and I'll be quick, I know I want to make sure others get to ask questions, at the research university, because that's part of the problem, is to create this movement around a rooted university, to re-inhabit, I mean, the, the university being part of where we live, the disconnect from the land, for all the reasons that you're describing, like this cuts to the heart of it. And I, I love this idea of the word body being land and getting rid of these binaries. Okay, so I've got a position of power at the university. I wanna figure out how we can re-energize re, uh, a science for the people with the people. And so that's not easy to do, but I do think we're making some progress. So my question is this, if we take for granted that we're living a perfect storm, that modernity is a, is a calamitous mess. Climate change, ecological degradation, widening disparities in wealth and helping the, the loss of biodiversity, both of our plants and animal friends, but also culturally, the languages that we're losing, it's a disaster and it's broken. And it's gonna force upon us the need to re-inhabit where we live. Now, whose terms is that gonna happen on? Because this could be a fascist localization, right? So the question for you is, if in fact, the, the, the supply lines are going to break, the financial institutions are going to collapse, we're going to start cooking with climate change, and people are now looking to you for save us, right? Save us, please. Finally, there's an awakening. Okay. So what, take our region, for instance, this is something I learned from Mike uh, Connolly, is that I used to think of our region as a binational region, the binational San Diego, Tijuana, and what about the native nations, my friend? You know, so already the, the notion of creating a new kind of language. But I wanna ask you if you could reflect on 
are we actually going to be able to will in this particular piece patch of earth where for 13 10 or 13,000 years kumiai have been living is it possible to align the kumiai and, and native nations with us and mexico in this particular kalibaha region what would governance look like and what does i'm in with this and what does history tell us about the way in which native nations federated and had a, a kind of somewhat of a more democratic way. It was less brutalist and it, it endured for you know, thousands and thousands of years. So what say you about the pot prospect in this particular Kalibaha region, basically conforming the sort of historical tromping grounds of the Kumeyaay, linking up with US Mexico tribal, is that even, is that fantasy land? Because this is something I'm thinking of putting a lot of effort into is we, if we could do that. Anyway, I'm done, yeah. Sorry, I Thank you for that. Those questions, uh, Keith. I, you know, the um, we have had talks about issues like this uh, in other other meetings and and uh it's uh i i think you you just have to find like minds and you know within the communities they're out there there are people in mexico who are, who are just as passionate about the the same things that that we talk about is and the people on this side of the border and of course we're a binational tribe the border goes right through the middle of our territory and so we have uh, kumiai people in mexico and many of them are, you know, we, we meet with them on a regular basis and they're, they are also, you know, in the same boat and they're, and they're looking at, uh, you know, their culture being, being destroyed. And then it's in different ways. The, the Mexican system is different than what we have in the United States, but they still have, um, have been subjected to, to a lot of the same attempts at cultural destruction and, and, um, and they're feeling the impacts of, of, uh, of climate change, uh, and in some cases, it's even even more poignant for them because they're they they have communities that are more reliant on on some of the traditional foods and medicines that they uh, that are getting scarcer and scarcer in some of the some of the habitats there. So, um, but we we have the the people there. Um, you know, I think on both sides, we just have to find like minds and. And keep building on that. Uh, keep adding to it, and 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 build the momentum. And I try to answer a little bit. So, uh, thank you for giving me the courage to be a little more pessimist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so recently, I almost got kicked out of the Smithsonian Native American Museum, and in this kind of plays right to your question. And I deal in a lot of intergovernmental affairs. Um, we have to quit lying to ourselves, period. Like the American education system um, process, all of that. It, it, I love where you're going, but uh, I'm not as optimist of like minds. We, we are too busy as a society living in a lie, a lie of, of our history, a lie of what, you know, e even a false sense of importance. So, um, and it, it, the beautiful thing I think is, is that we're here today, right? And we're bringing some truth to the table, like we heard earlier, how do we get it to a broader audience? I think that's where a foundation like you're, you're talking about too, is if we could get a broader dissemination of platforms like this, of panels like this, of people who have lived, lived this and, and lived successes, in terms of intergovernmental and you know the the relationships with nature, so um, yeah, I don't, I don't see it in in any modern governmental structure. Um, you know, I am in Northwest Washington, really liberal area, and I still don't see that. I still th still think, and it was asked at Western Washington University. Somebody asked, you know, how could they help? Things like that, and similar. And it, I asked just simply listen to my story that, and that's it. And I think that's, that's the foundation. Um, and hopefully we are still here and still resilient enough to continue and perpetuate 
this and, and maybe build to something, but I don't see that for this generation. Maybe, you know, it is something to strive for. So I, I think in, in just kind of thinking about this question, um, you know, I, I spoke earlier about paternalism um, and misogyny, and I think those are a few of the systems that have actively prevented this kind of coming together, right? And and I think if there's going to be any kind of, you know, alliance, that has to be dealt with. And so I don't ever think that the U.S. government will recognize the damage that they have done and continually perpetuate on indigenous peoples here, just here in the United States. Um, and so for me, I see hope in like what Miranda is doing and, and this younger generation, because they have a sense of unity and sort of, they're tired of our shit. And they've seen what we have done. They've seen the decisions that we have made and they're sick of it. And I, I don't blame them. I am on the tail end of a Gen Xer and I have some really, so I have major thoughts about the boomers, right? And that generation. And so I can only imagine what these younger folks are doing, but it's those kinds of organizations. It's those kinds of movements that are, sort of cross-cutting these lines of race and class and education that we've never seen before. Um, and, and so for me, I see the hope in these younger generations to be able to do that because a lot of us who are, were born in the late 1900s, <laughs> we, we uphold the these antiquated systems of, of status right and and what it means to occupy these different levels and and these younger generations they don't that's it doesn't mean anything to them and so i see the hope there in in the movements that they are leading because they're they're not afraid in the same way that we're afraid and i see this with my own kids where they don't have any fear of the government like i did like i do and I have less fear of the government than my parents did. And so it's it's a generational change that every generation that comes, we're preparing them to have less and less fear and to, to step into what they have to in order to help us. Because really, this is our hope. This is our future. Y'all are our future. And so making these decisions, hearing what we're saying and learning from our mistakes is part of that process. But the timing, I don't know if that's aligning to where that's going to happen by the time everything goes to, right? And, and that's the scary thing for me is, is, is trying to pull this, this piece, right? this other side of us it, up to speed and trying to catch up with these folks who are just running compared to what we are doing. And so there's going to be a shift or a rip somewhere that we have to contend with. And, and so I don't, I don't know what that looks like other than it's going to be outside of what we're comfortable with and, and what we know. And so that I think is, is where we're headed. And, and that to me is my hopes. <laughs> there are some online questions um one the first one is given the title of this seminar today what are your thoughts on non-native or quote-unquote invasive species interactions with the native community in terms of restoration what are some methods from western science that may not or does not align with traditional ecological knowledge just as removing and killing quote-unquote problematic species Yes. I think, I, let me simplify the question. I think the question is essentially that Western science, and we talked about this with, um, in, the, in the land acknowledgement introduction, um, Anishinaabe wisdom and science does not treat these species, different species, right? They, they, they understand, as I understand it, 
um, as nations themselves. And they understand them plants, animals relating to colonization, but they're not invasive. They're part of, and we see, you know, perhaps um, Edward, you can speak to this in terms of what's going on in Glen and Grand Canyons, right? With the killing of what National Park Service and Bureau of Reclamation deem quote unquote invasive species. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, it's invasive species of thought. I, I hadn't really thought of it as actual invasive species, but, uh, but I, I have been in, involved in, in that, uh, in restoration projects and, and, um, it, you know, I, I don't, I, I think sometimes there's invasive species and, and I don't even know if that's the right term to use for them. Um, but they, they have become uh, integrated into the into the ecosystem, and 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 to get rid of them is is you're just going to have to destroy the ecosystem to to try to um, to get them out. And some of them have actually become incorporated even into our traditional foods and and medicines. So it's um, um, I think you need to look at it on a case by case basis. I don't. Uh, I, I don't like the the to try to poison out everything and to, to get rid of of a, of a particular species and that's one of the things that's done with um, the arundo and and tamarisk and in some of the areas and um, but in some sometimes you know the the native species are very resilient the native species of insects will eventually. Uh, also adapt and and uh, there's grasshoppers now that eat tamarisk that didn't uh, when it was first starting to spread around in a lot of the a lot of the areas and so they're 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 adapting to these and it's a food source and so they're they're going after it i i think what we can do though is many times is is at least give our native species an opportunity to adapt slow down the encroachment of these endangered species so so maybe there are areas where Arundo has just become a, a monoculture that you want to go in and uh, uh, and take it out or take part of it out or you know to give the native species a, a chance to to um, to flex their muscle a little bit. The even in the coastal areas, uh, the grasses, European grasses, there it it's because of the continual disturbance that um, that they're that they proliferate because they're more adapted to being continually disturbed. And our native grasses, they, they grow primarily right at, at the end of the rainy season and then they go to seed and then they go dormant so just because of our environment. So if you take away that uh, continual disturbance, even in some cases bring back um, chamise uh, that's uh, our brush that grows out here, you can uh, you can help to tilt the balance back in in favor of the of the native species. And in some cases, this just means removing the the grazing animals that are that have been introduced into into an ecosystem. But it, it's really complex, and um, and in ecosystem restoration, uh, if you get involved in that that kind of work, it's um, uh, you you really need to go in with with a plan, but with an understanding that you, you not only do you have a plan, but you have an adaptive management plan that, so that you can go in and see how things are progressing and do, you need to do more um, to, to keep it on the, on the right path. I, one of the things that I, I've also done in meeting with, uh, with people that are doing restoration work is to, is to always tell, ask them what, where is your component about uh, of native interaction with that ecosystem? If you're going to do a restoration on on an area, what were the traditional uh, practices that that went, were going on in that area before, and how are you going to make that a part of your management plan in the future? And start looking at humans um, not simply as something that destroys everything in its path, but uh, as a keystone species in the ecosystem how that can be incorporated then into your plan.
that I think takes us up to our ending point. We apologize to those who posted questions online and we didn't get to. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey in one second, but I just wanna thank everybody for coming, speaking. Yes, thank you to all of our speakers. And thank you to Giorgio and Shasta. So please, can we just give all of our speakers and moderators another round of applause? We are truly honored to have you all here tonight. I don't know if you all are as emotional and challenged like at the same time as I am. Like I loved having this virtual talk last year and it's just even more unique and special this year that I get to meet you in person. So thank you again to our speakers and to our moderators. And thank you to our audience members. I know sitting in a place for three hours is a long time, but we do have a reception just up the stairs with food. So if you're hungry like I am, please join us afterwards, immediately following this. Uh, stretch your legs out, join us for some food and beverages just up the stairs on the third level on our terrace. So again, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we will follow up. Uh, with this recording, because it is recorded, we're going to go ahead and add that to our web page uh, later on this week. So you can check back on our web page uh, and go ahead and check out our previous talks that are all recorded as well. So they're all on our website uh, that you can check out on these QR codes. But again, thank you. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our moderators. And join us for some food. Thank you. Get on the stage.